thanks very much, everybody, for coming today. I'm, I'm really pleased. I thought with spring break and everything coming up that we <coughs> wouldn't have much of a crowd today. So we're really pleased to have this opportunity to introduce the Michigan Swimmer's Edge Partnership to all of you and just let you know what we're up to. And I'm going to try to be brief here because I know what you really want is the information about Swimmer's Edge that Kurt is going to be able to uh, provide for you. And uh, we're happy to have her on here, too, to answer questions about uh, about the control and research work that he's done. So, MISIP is how we call ourselves, or Michigan Swimmer's Itch Partnership, and we have a website if you're interested in going to find more information on Swimmer's Itch, uh, which is right up there. Um, we are, an inform as Gail said, an informal partnership of about 30 lake associations in Michigan, and we're hoping to grow. And we work together on swimmers' itch control, monitoring, prevention, research, and education. We have an eight-member steering committee that guides the uh, recommendations of the partnership. Currently, those are the lakes that are on the steering committee. And as Gail said, uh, we're really pleased to be partnering with Tip of the Mitt, uh, who is acting as our fiduciary. Uh, particularly at this point um, on administering the state grant. Lindy has been terrific in helping with that. And um, so that's been a really positive partnership. Here's our mission statement. It's pretty simple. We work together with other lake associations, provide leadership in Michigan to address swimmers itch through effective, comprehensive, science-based control programs, development and testing, of preventative measures and general research and education. We have a whole bunch of objectives that I'm not going to take the time to read now, but basically the, the main thrust of those objectives is educate, advocate, and assist. And I'm going to go through a few of the things that we've done to move that forward. So one of our objectives is to inform members of our lake associations, et cetera, et cetera, about the importance of our lake re resources in Michigan and the serious adverse impacts of swimmer's itch. When um, our, um, the Michigan Swimmer's Itch uh, Partnership founder, Jim Bondale from Higgins Lake, started thinking about how this impacts lakes, and as they started working with originally SICON and then uh, Swimmer's Itch Solutions to uh, control swimmer itch on their lake. They had a very serious problem. He started thinking bigger than just solving it on their lake, and I really applaud him for that because he re realized that we need to spread this information throughout Michigan and maybe even further to, to show lakes that there are solutions. And I have to say that since we've been putting the word out and speaking at more conferences and making ourselves more accessible, we've received the most kind of heartbreaking phone calls from people about how they have silently had their children not swim for 10 years on their lake and not realizing that there were ways that uh, swimmers that could be reduced and that they could be able to utilize their waterfront homes again and that riparians at public parks, or not riparians, visitors to public parks could swim again. So we're really heartened that, some, that uh, people are starting to learn that there are solutions. We're working really hard to find ways to reduce the costs of control because it's, it's difficult for lakes sometimes to be able to afford the control measures. But we think that we've identified at the moment the best way to control swimmer's itch at this point in time, and Kurt will talk about that. And uh, we're excited that we're, we're beginning to spread the word. Here are some of the things that we've done in the past three years. We have an annual conference. We'll probably have another one in September. It's not scheduled yet, but we like to schedule it. At that point in time, because the summer work will have been done and the researchers and contractors can let us know what they found during the, during the field season and new things that are cropping up and new questions that they're excited about answering. Um, for the second year in a row, we'll be presenting at the Michigan Lake and Stream Association's annual conference. That's coming up April 21st at Crystal Mountain. If any of you are interested, these, that will be a, a two and a half hour program that will have a lot more depth of information on. We'll have Kurt presenting again, Ron presenting again, and a guy named Wayne Swallow who's been developing a preventative cream that he is uh, feeling is moving along. We'll see, you know, people have been trying to do that for a long time, but he's excited about that and his pres presentation should be really interesting. 
Um, I can't count how many presentations our contractors and other people have made to individual lake association, to community organizations. Uh, we've been encouraging presentations all over the place. We also established the website that I talked to you before, which is a central place people can go to learn information about Swimmer's Itch. And then in, in addition to that, um, we have had a lot of substantial conversations with Michigan DNR <coughs> and with uh, state representatives and senators so that everybody is aware of the issues about Swimmer's Itch. And I'll talk a little bit more about our conversations with the DNR. One of the results of these uh, very lengthy meetings we've had with the DNR over the past year and a half is uh, really exciting. The DNR, prior to this, in order to obtain a permit to do control work or remove mergansers from a lake, it required a, sci a scientific collector's permit. Is that the right terminology? That included three years of a, a three-year research program. It was a rigorous process, and the, uh, the Michigan DNR didn't really want to issue a huge number of those types of permits. So it, by its nature, restricted the number of lakes who were able to do the kind of control work that was done on Higgins Lake and now the other four lakes that are actively in control. So we finally convinced them that um, to develop a merganser control permit program. And we're really pleased to announce that it was finally approved by the Natural Resources Commission in February. So we're on our way to more accessibility for lots of lakes to be able to do the control work that can absolutely reduce the incidence of swimmer's itch on your lakes. And that, that's a very exciting development. And, and a, a result pretty directly of uh, the work that the Michigan Swimmer's Itch Partnership did with uh, MDNR. And I have to say that the, the oh, DNR man. has been really great uh, in terms That's of okay. um, in terms of working cooperatively with us, listening to our opinions, and asking us to kind of partner with them to design this program so that it'll be the most effective program. <coughs> we'll see. But we're in our first year, and we're hoping that they'll continue to work with us so that we can identify areas of, that are difficult in the permit application and I think we'll be able to continue to refine it as time goes on. The other, uh, one of the other big objectives, and this is, this is the meat of everything and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because Kurt is going to tell you about this today, but we wanted to advance state-of-the-art swimmers itch science for control, monitoring programs, preventive, you know, for all these reasons. <coughs> And uh, these are just a couple of uh, little shots of some of the work that was done this summer. Um, these are the traps that are set up to trap the mergansers. It's a complex and uh, more difficult than you might think. Those little mergansers are wily little things <laughs> and difficult to trap. But these guys have figured it out and they do a great job. And here is, of course, Kurt and his dad, Harvey. Um, who was one of the pioneers, or maybe the pioneer of this, of uh, controlling swimmers itch, especially up here, releasing mergansers. In addition to control work and all the all the uh, the work that's been done on refining control techniques for mergansers, we've done a couple of other things that we are hoping will help to reduce the cost ultimately of, um, of doing work on lakes and, and to be able to quickly analyze uh, lakes, uh, the level of, uh, of the swimmer's itch parasite in, in, in a body of water. It's called qPCR. <coughs> I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to explain the whole thing to you, but it is a promising new method that analyzes the level in a, in a sample of water. This summer, uh, a lab was established, several technicians were trained, and um, uh, in addition to that, utilizing that same technique, it allowed us to do s some other research, including some of the things I've listed up here, testing of the effectiveness of copper sulfate, the study of circaria distribution, and the impacts on the time of day, temperature, and the wind, and other things about you know, what affects your risk of, of getting swimmer's itch. There's myths all over the place, as we all know. Anybody that's 
been swimming in a lake that has swimmer's itch, everybody thinks they know exactly what to do to avoid swimmer's itch. To, you know, sometimes that's successful and sometimes that's not, but we're trying to find out more about it, understand the life cycle so that we can give people better guidance. And then in addition to the QPCR lab, a bunch of other studies were done this summer. Um, there were numerous nesting studies that were conducted. Here's Kurt looking up here at a nest. <laughs> yeah, not a natural one, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. And then here is some tagging of a merganser uh, that was being done during, um, during a training session with one of the two bio new biologists that were trained in trap and removal techniques. So another goal uh, is in, in terms of the assist part of uh, what the Michigan Swimmers Edge Partnership do, do, does is to try to identify sources of funding so that we can assist lakes in uh, assessing their lakes and in doing the control work, which as we've said has been expensive. We're working on bringing those costs down, but nevertheless it's an expense for a lake. Uh, we, Thanks again to Jim Bondale's leadership, we received um, an allocation from the state last year for $250,000, and then our current year we have another $250,000 grant that we're that we're administering right now. And there's a request in for this next state budget year. It's still there as a line item, but you know it's a difficult budget year for the state, and so we we're hopeful that it'll stay in and we'll get some more some more funding, but if not, we're going to have to identify some other sources of funds and, and we're working on programs for that. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the first year or so, the allocations were primarily distributed to the lakes with control programs. As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, these control programs were expensive, testing them out, refining them, utilizing methods. You know, we are all hopeful that this work and that the uh, work that the lake is the five lake associations that are doing control the investments that they put in that can help make it more accessible more affordable for the new lakes that participate um, so that's been primarily where the money has gone and other allocations have gone to uh, finding new relocation sites when you remove a merganser from a lake you have to then put that merganser somewhere the mergansers are not harmed and we try to find s sites, and the state has to certify them so that um, so that they are removed to a place where the swimmers' its life cycle cannot be completed. So it's a complicated process, but you know, normally um, it would be a place where the snail, that is the other part of the life cycle, is not present. Um, so we're doing that, trying to find more sites. We are. Um, we have a new program that I don't know if all of you have received the letter, but we have a program that offers assist some limited assistance to lakes to, to conduct assessments. And the assessments will be necessary in order to fill out your application next year for a control permit. So I'll go into that in a minute. And then there's some money that's gone towards research and of course education and the conferences that we put on. In 2008, I've pretty much gone through this. These are our primary activities. <coughs> and I just wanted to spend one more minute talking about this new lake assessment cost share program. It's hot off the press. I believe we just sent out an email to our lakes uh, last week. Um, but we have some dollars that are, um, that are allocated to help lakes that are interested in getting their lake assessed. So just to back up one second about the assessment, in order to qualify for a merganser control permit through the state of Michigan, you have to have certain information that um, we can, I'm not gonna go through all the qualifications, certain information involving the presence of the swimmer's itch parasite on your lake, the presence of the, the mergansers, uh, you know, and a, a certain amount of uh, survey work has to be done. So in order to assist lakes in getting this work done so that they can then begin the work of, of removing mergansers from the lake and reducing their levels of swimmer's itch, we have uh, offered a program where we will um, match up to no more than 50% of the assessment cost, a maximum of $3,000. There, there are 
two different ways you can do assessments. One includes uh, a little bit more or maybe a lot more uh, research component and then uh, other assessment programs could be just the basics of assessment that allow you to apply for the permit. So that's why there's two different maximums. The steps that you would need to, to take is um, if you are interested in the program and the there's a letter that details this, so if any of you have not received it and are interested in it, just email me and I'll get you a copy. But basically, quickly, it's just to notify me of your intent to do this. Contact one or both contractors to negotiate, to negotiate an agreement. Fortunately for you, they're both in the room today, so <laughs> before signing, then you need to contact me to confirm that the, the funding is still available, that it hasn't been used up by the other lakes and then uh, go ahead and sign your contract and forward it to, to uh, me. So, pretty simple. This is why we're here today, just a little reminder. <laughs> <coughs> and I, I thank you for, again, for letting us speak. Here's my contact information, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. And on to Kurt. All right. Uh, it's good to see some faces that I recognize. I want to really be conscious of trying to give enough time for your questions. I think I've been to too many conferences where it's supposed to be a panel and in the hour it's about five minutes left over for questions. So I will probably go through these slides pretty quickly. There's a lot of visual stuff. I do, I was asked to give you the Higgins Lake story, the success story you've had on Higgins Lake, and I'll concentrate most of my effort on that. Um, my team um, that's working with me is, of course, my father is a, a well-known uh, swimmer's itch biologist and we've got Randy DeYoung, who studied under Sam Loker in New Mexico, which is the probably the other swimmers it's guru in the United States. Um, and so he comes with some good pedigree and an engineer on staff on our team to help us with some our new trap designs that we have. Um, I don't think very many of you have heard a talk. I stole a slide from a different talk. I'm a teacher, so I like to start out with a little quiz, right? I, I should be in class today. Uh, my students are thankful I'm up here, but so I'm gonna, you're gonna be my students. Um, who's to blame for swimmer's itch? I'll give you some multiple choice. <laughs> all the snails in a lake, all the ducks on a lake, the stagnicola snails on a lake, maybe that's not a term you've heard of before, the common merganser ducks on a lake, and don't you hate it when teachers do this? <laughs> a and B, right? Um, C and D, right? And there's always one thrown in there, Glenn Rich the DNR, right? They always throw in one answer that doesn't make any sense, or none of the above. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Go with your first gut instinct. C. F. 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 H. I haven't heard the right answer until just like none. It's not the ducks. It's not the snails. It's the parasite that causes swimmer's itch. That's what we're after. Now, you've probably seen lots of life cycles of swimmer's itch parasite, but you really haven't seen the full life cycle. This, from a parasitologist's perspective, is a life cycle. There's the adult worm that lives in a vertebrate host, usually a duck, but not always. Here's the form, it's a larval stage of the parasite that lives in a, always a snail, right? But not always a stagnicola snail. This is not a life cycle that you see. We see these three things, these two, all three of these things are in the water, right? But we don't see the adult worm because it lives in a host. Same thing with the intermediate um, form that lives in a snail. And then of course, humans are really not involved in the swimmer's cycle directly. In fact, the parasites don't want to find us. Right? They penetrate our skin and they die, and it's a dead end for them. Here is the list of suspects. Now, one thing I want to be really cautious of you about is not every lake is the same. We know the story pretty well for a lot of lakes, and the common merganser is the culprit that carries two species of you know, parasites that cause some itch. But that's not true everywhere. It can be, there's a whole host, these are all in the avian schistosome group. And this is a phylogeny that was done. Here are the different snail species that can serve as hosts. And each snail species, each species of the parasite has an appropriate definitive host. Here's the, the common merganser. It can also occur in mallards and Canada geese, even muskrats and red winged blackbirds. So that's why the state of Michigan is saying, we're gonna give permits to lakes, but you have to show us that the parasites that go through common mergansers are present on your lake. Otherwise, they're gonna be given permits to lakes that don't need it. Here's the culprit in Glen Lake. Um, a long time ago, Glen Lake was kind of the first group that said, listen, we don't want to treat our lakes with copper sulfate, which was the only control option for a long time. 
right? Um, until Ron and my father came along and said, you know what, we're gonna design a program that's much more environmental friendly and we're gonna attack the problem at the duck level. So this happened to be the culprit, it's Trichobelharzia stagnicola, the snail is stagnicoli, right? That's where you get the name. We did some work in 2002 and 2003 in Wexford County in, in downstate, in Lake Cadillac and Lake Mitchell. It wasn't the Comaraganser species that was there, it was a different species of swimmer's itch parasite. So one of the first steps is when Higgins Lake came to, uh, I was teaching at the University of Michigan Bio Station in 2014, and they got an email um, from someone on Higgins Lake and said, we have a massive problem, can you help us out? My dad was my TA at the time. He had patched the torch and I got cheap labor from him and being a TA. And, uh, and so we met with Higgins Lake and we said, well, it's been a long time since any control work has been done, but if you really think there's a need, we'll fire it back up. And so that's what started the whole process. The first question is, who's the guilty culprit? How many different species of swimmer's itch parasites are circulating on Higgins Lake? Well, unlike our judicial system, we did the opposite. We just said, Comaraganser, the species in Comaraganser, you're the guilty party until proven innocent. Because we didn't want to lose a year or two trying to figure out all the different species that were cycling. Based on the evidence from Glen Lake and some of the other evidence that I'd taken with my class and from lakes around the area, um, we were pretty confident that this was gonna be a major player. So here's Higgins Lake, this is now 2015, year one, right? We felt like um, we wanted to present them with a three-year science-based comprehensive program. The first step was to take um, an assessment. We need to know which species are cycling in Higgins Lake, just like excuse me, the DNR is asking all lakes that are interested in applying for a permit to do something similar. The DNR doesn't care how many different species are on your lakes, they just want to know that the one that is carried by the Comorganser is there so that it's appropriate to uh, allow permit to be uh, established. Here's a baseline assessment. Um, we wanted to have a measurement. How effective is our program? and we felt really strongly that that has to be answered through science. And so we took a, a background measurement, a controlled measurement the first year so that we could compare subsequent years to see how, how we're doing. There was also a competing program on the lake at the same time that involved harassment. And I know some lakes in this area have used harassment in the spring. Uh, we thought that was an ideal opportunity for us to do a little mini experiment and compare the effects of harassment with trap and removal. We spent a lot of time looking for nests and trapping and relocating broods, and then a big part of the mission is to let people know um, the myths of swimmer's itch, right? Um, toweling off, you've probably heard that I don't know how many different times. That's great if it's one of two species that are present on your lake, those two species aren't very common. So toweling off, it doesn't hurt, but it probably doesn't give you as much benefit as you first thought. <laughs> so which parasite species are present on Higgins Lake? I'm gonna go through this real quickly. You take snails, you shed them individually. Here's what the cercari look like, right? And you can identify them if you're trained by sight. There's also, uh, as Susan mentioned, a new technique called qPCR that allows you to take water samples and bypass the, um, the looking for snails. Um, right now, I know that it's in the, in the works to have a metric that, a qPCR method that specifically tests for species. Right now, it tests for all the different species that carry swimmers itch, so it's, um, unless you do more work after the fact, it's harder to figure out if Trichobelharzia stagnicola is there. But I don't think we're too far, too many years away from having a much more specific test for that. Also conducting bird surveys, right? We want to match which host species are potentially on a lake and which snail species are potentially on a lake, so you do both. And on Higgins Lake, we found Canada geese, mallards, Seagulls, there's no such thing as a seagull, an ornithologist will tell you, um, but that's what everybody calls them. Even bald eagles, right? So then you take fecal samples, you know it's a crappy job, pun intended, but someone's gotta do it, right? You get the undergraduates to do that, and you look for eggs that are present and hatch in Demericidium. And it's really important that you get the hatchier birds on a lake, because if you pick a mallard and you, it's positive, or a, can, a common reganser, it's positive, that common organser may have come from a different lake in the previous year, and so you've got to really show it's present on your lake, and then you look for this. So there's some pictures there. I'm going through this pretty quickly. Um, yeah, we were right, it was guilty. Um, tri Trichobelharchia stagnicola is the major player there. It's the common organser as the adult host, and stagnicola emarginata as the intermediate host. So we chose 10 locations around Higgins Lake. You can see the names we've given them, and we collected um, a thousand snails the first year from each of those locations. Pretty labor intensive. Here's the chart, four different times of the summer. There's a lot of numbers here. 
the percentages on top and then parentheses is the number of snails we collected. Look at the colors. It's so much easier to look at the colors. Given the work that was done by my father and Ron on, on Glen Lake, 2% infection level was a really, really bad infection level. So we kind of said that's gonna be our epidemic level because in their work they hadn't really seen anything much higher than that. So I color coded, that's red for anything over two, uh, less than 0 0.25, 10% of that is ideal. And you can see, except for the Yacht Club here, this is not a very, you don't want to jump in Higgins Lake, at least not in 2015. So we had a trap, um, I'm going to try to give you a little, one of the things about our trap is um, it's got, um, let's see if I can get this, uh, some remote control, um, and just kind of a, adds a little bit more effectiveness to it. You can see how quickly, so the net's on the bottom there and it gets pulled up, right? Um, and we've worked on improving that so it goes through water quite quickly. So here is a net that we set up, right? There's our two electronic poles. Um, that's open, so the birds feel like, you know, it's hard for them to see the net that far away. And they come swimming in like this, <laughs> right? You're on the, um, behind a bush, behind a tree, and a house, you hit the button and the net comes up right here. They don't like that sound and they hightail it towards the V and they get stuck and we catch them. Here's what um, the common, you know, so our first year in 2015, we caught nine broods with 88 total ducklings, okay, a lot. Next year, we were able to find nest, a couple nests. Here's a picture of what we noticed early in the morning. Um, we put a camera on it once we found it. Look to the left, you're gonna see a shadow. Here comes a female common regan. She's not very graceful. They're not really good perching birds. They're good diving birds. And someone said, well, how do you know that's a nest? Well, we kept the camera on her. Here's July 11, 2016. And this is kind of really cool footage. Not very many people have seen this. Here's the female, the mom. She's clucking. Look at what's coming off her back. Ooh, a little twirling. Here's, uh, there's always a last strangler. I don't want to go, mom. I'm afraid. I don't, I don't want to really jump. I mean, you're talking about 35 feet up. Boom, finally goes down, right? This nest was on the property of someone who didn't want to kill any of the birds. In the first summer, they did not want that nest touched. Thankfully, I can report that about a month ago, they finally said, come on in, we don't want to pay for it sealed, but someone else volunteered to do that, and now this nest is sealed. And we think that the females come back every year to the same nest. We don't know what's gonna happen this summer. Will she find a different hole nearby, or will she have to go to a whole another different lake? We're not sure about that. All right, um, after you catch the ducks, this is, um, you don't get a chance to see common regans or ducklings. They're on their way, in this case, to Lake Huron. Pretty content. Again, I try to make a lot of visual stuff here. People like pictures. Uh, here we're releasing the hen with, a, with her brood, abandoned. Last year we started web tagging the, the, the ducklings because some people at Higgins Lake felt <laughs> like, um, you know, those ducklings are going to come back to Higgins Lake and we feel if you get them early enough, they haven't had a chance to imprint, imprint in their na natal area. So by moving them early enough, we're pretty convinced they'll come back to where they get located, like in Lake Huron. But we're not for sure that, so we've got some tags on 170 ducklings from last year. Uh, new technologies, this is now 2017, using drones. Um, it's amazing what they can do. It's not an easy thing though, even though you've got the technology. So here's a drone lifting off on the island on Higgins Lake. You can see the quality of imaging this is. Uh, I'm going to skip it because I'm going to forward you to. So in one of the videos that we shot, we saw this image and you look right there and you say, boy, that looks like a cavity. And you zoom in a little bit more. You can't see it very easily on the on the screen, but on my computer there looks to be, we think, is a head of a female here. Um, but that would be an ideal nesting site, and then you go up and you can get a camera or climb it to see if there's active eggs. These are candidate nesting holes that we didn't see birds fly into, but they fit the sort of general shape and location of where you might find the nest. Even if they're not holes, they probably should be plugged in case they might be used in the future. Uh, developed a little camera, fiber optics camera, that allows us to look into nests. Um, there was some controversy on Higgins Lake about what do you do with these nest boxes that have been put up and the DNR said once the eggs are in there you can't touch them. So we, we needed to verify that there were indeed eggs in the box. And so we used our little camera here and showed there's a clutch of eggs. Uh, I can tell you with certainty that all of those eggs hatch, well most of those eggs hatch and they all were caught 
and move to Lake, Lake uh, or to Lake Huron. Here are us putting web tags on the ducklings and bands on the females. Um, you can't put a band on a duckling, the legs grow uh, too quickly and um, they don't want some the, the ducklings getting hurt or strangled on their legs. So here's uh, removing or re relocating them. This is near Sutton's Bay where we released a brood. In 2017, remember 2015, eight broods, or nine broods, 88 ducklings. Now we're down to four broods and 56 ducklings. I have to show you this. This is kind of cute. How how loyal are the ducklings? Okay, so you're going to see, I'm going to release the female, and you're going to see the ducklings don't quite know where to go, and they go all over. Watch the ones, they're supposed to go in the water, they go behind them a truck. Uh-oh. The mom's calling. You hear the mom? There she is calling. Watch what happens along this side. Oh, they're the ones that went around the truck, and there's always a straggler. Oh, she took the wrong turn. He went left instead of right, but all back with mom. And we feel pretty confident um, that they'll do quite well there. Okay, so here are totals for removing a broods. And you can see 19 broods in total. That's a lot of birds over three years. Now let's go back to that baseline assessment, right? That's what it looked like before we started working. The second year of our program, look at the color change. Wow. Right? There's still some spots. You know, you go swimming on Samoset Park in July, you might gonna get some papules and swimmer's ditch is never broadly, uh, evenly distributed. It's always clumpy and, and, and lots of places that are, are bad. Um, look at this spot here. Last year's data, we found four infected snails out of 8,000 that we looked at, right? In fact, it was so low, we didn't even collect the last 2,000 of the snails because the, the numbers were so small. Uh, I talked about the harassment program. Um, we compared the data to a lake that was doing harassment, and I'm not going to name the lake because I don't want to get anybody upset at me. But here are the collection sites in July that we got green spots most places. This one was pretty hot. Overall, on the bottom, it was a yellow co color. Right? In 2015, they had four common merganza broods. The Lake Association at that time decided to invest twice as much in harassment. So they put twice as many man hours or human hours into it. I think even got a second boat, not for sure on that. In 2016, they had eight broods. So there's some evidence that the harassment is not helping reduce the brood numbers. What do you think is gonna happen if I were to take a look at the snail infection levels in 2017, what's gonna happen to the color? Twice as many broods of mergansers. Look at the brood, the color, right? Again, not a very, good place to let your kids swim in it for that. Uh, fortunately, now the mergansers on this lake are being trapped and removed. So, um, so there's some good things there. We always wanna add you know, some research projects, although most lake associations are really interested in control, right? That's what you really want your money spent for. And so in order to in inform control, you need to do be current and think of different ways to answer the same questions or, or better ways to answer the questions. So, we're gonna put GPS tags on females to try to find the nest. It's not easy to find the nest, so we're hoping that. Um, I think this study needs to be done. The science is just screaming for it. This is the old method. This is the new method. Um, you gotta compare the new method to the old method to see how effective it is. And, and, and we think that there's gonna be a really good correlation. And I will tell you that I do think the future is qPCR is gonna be um, just as good, if not better, than snail infection. But it answers a different kind of question. It really does. It's more of a time specific and location specific assessment versus a whole lake assessment. Although you can use this for a whole lake, it gets kind of a little bit tricky because the variation in Sakari released are so great. We're gonna do some work. I've got some brains of common organzers that were shot um, by another group in the freezer at UMBS and I'm waiting for the chemist to do the project, but um, Tim is busy with other things. Um, we're trying to figure out if some of the after second year birds that come back, do they come back to the same lake where they hatched, or do they come back to, or they go into different lakes? So that's another, you know, it's a pilot project that we have going. And the new common organzer traffic techniques are always um, important. So I went through this fast, but I told my, Susan and I agree, we should try to leave 10, 20 minutes for questionings if we can. So I'm pretty close to right on that. Yeah, so that's the Higgins Lake story. Um, I guess at this time we can open it up for any questions. I'm sorry I talked real fast. Yeah. So you've dismissed one myth about the toweling thing. Um, what about well, not totally dismissed it. If it works for you, keep doing it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what about the whole idea of, you know, stay out of the shallows, swim in the deep? 
it, are you collecting the, the however you pronounce the, <laughs> the bug that comes into the human, are you collecting those in deep water or just in shallows? Um, you know, uh, t there have been a lot of studies that have been looking at done that, both published and not published. And it's no doubt the, the fact that the cercari that are in common regansers, the species in common regansers are positive phototactic, so they go to the surface, right? Um, they also are released, when I was an undergraduate at Hope, I got the dirty job of counting cercari every two hours from snails, and through the night, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I wasn't collecting poop while well, I was doing everything, but that's, <laughs> and they definitely get released during the light more often. And so mm -hmm. one of the tricks we use is when we catch snails is we cover them in black cloth and wait till the following morning to um, put light on them. And then when that light happens, the sakari um, will shed from the snails in, in the greatest number. So we know a lot about time of day. So obviously it's better probably to do swim out in the deep where you can get some dilution effect where the snails aren't as uh, dense as they are in the shallow ends. Onshore winds are not good because again, these parasites are planktonic and they're gonna get carried. So with an onshore wind, you'd expect, it makes natural sense that there'd be higher concentrations. And I think the QPCR studies that were done last summer um, showed the same kind of trends. Yeah, Mark. The snails in Douglas Lake, and I imagine many other lakes, have been severely depleted by zebra mussels. And yet you still have what's 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 going on so that's another research study that really needs to be done okay. um, another one that I've heard a lot of is the phosphorus levels right what effect is that having it increases algae snails eat algae so it's going to increase the snails it's you need to be a snail expert when you say the snails are decreased due to zebra mussels is that all the species of snails I know Stagnicola I've been at Douglas Lake um, they, they had a crash. I was collecting snails from there for the last eight years. Yeah. Now they're back. Some mm -hmm. of them are back. They like clear water. They, they are not like a snail that likes a lot of marshy areas. So what are the zebra mussels doing? And they're clearing, they're clearing a, a lot of the water. So some snails might have a huge negative impact long term. Others might now have, there's a niche available for some of them to expand. So at Higgins Lake, they've reported, and I haven't. I don't have the numbers from ten years ago, but they tell everybody tells you there's hundreds more snails around and a lot less crayfish, okay. right? And crayfish are one of the natural predators of snails when they're young. So you you hit a good point, and there's no doubt that zebra mussels and quagga mussels have an effect. We just don't know what it is yet. Uh, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, they, you don't get swimmers that you, or you can, it's just less. Probably. So, um, swimmer's itch can be, you can get swimmer's itch in the uh, ocean, right? It's called clam digger's itch. It's, it's one of the other avian schistosomes that we don't have. But the parasite that uses the commerganser requires stagnically marginal snails. We spent, Randy and I spent two whole days on East Tawas looking at 10 sites, um, about uh, an hour each site, and we found no stagnically marginata pockets. We also went to the University of Michigan's Mollusks uh, Museum and looked at records. And we did find a few records of stagnicola in Huron, but that's one of the things that DNR is really concerned about. Are you putting the birds at places where there's not the right snails? Right? They, we don't, they don't want us moving the problem somewhere else. Well, yeah, and Lake Michigan and Lake Huron traditionally are devoid of, although I did find some of those snails in Sutton's Bay. So, you know, we, we got to do more research on that. Uh, there also, uh, you know, if if it's a shoreline on Lake Michigan or Lake Huron, where a a, a river from a lake connecting it to to you know Lake Michigan or Lake Huron comes in, once in a while, like in Leland, for example, if the wind is just right and the currents are just right, you know, this people get swimmers itch on that beach because it comes out of the river and it just kind of moves along the shoreline where all the kids are swimming so <coughs> it isn't frequent I, and I we don't know how but that does happen how far so carry travel in a day yeah right? yeah right yeah what is the harassment program um <laughs> it depends on what lake you're at um traditionally it's using pyrotechnics uh shooting out boomers oh. uh these um uh, guns that aren't real you know but they're loud noise makers uh, there is also a harassment program with lethal take. Um, one lake was able to get permission from the DNR to inject um, killing a few females in the process of doing the harassing. Um, so, so it's a spring to harassment. To get rid of them. Yeah, the they're idea is they're the teenagers, place. right? They're they're at this time of year they're going to start pairing up. So if you scare them, hopefully they'll go somewhere else. Well, they may just fly another mile and a half down the lake and do their thing. We don't know. Right? Uh, 
You showed the uh, brood leaving the tree. Uh huh. Were you able to uh, tag that uh, female to see yes. whether it comes back or not? Yes, we were. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we're not able to find that female coming out of it. We caught her again last year, but we don't know if it was that tree. You know, we assume it was that tree, but we did catch her again. Um, and I think females have been caught several years in a row back in the, in the 80s and 90s when they were working on Glen Lake, got the same females that were banded three, four, five years in a row, if not longer. The ducklings, we think, won't come back, right, if you get them early enough, but we don't know. So we did that study to find out. Yeah? Um, you mentioned this. there are other ducks and other snails that may carry it. Now, is there an association, like there's a dancer with the one species here, so like, say, a mallard? Is there a certain snail that that's yes, associated with? Yes, there is. There is. And the combination is, is unique for each parasite species. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's the trick. You know, in order to identify properly which species you have, either you've got to have a lot of experience working with this or you need to take a sample of DNA from um, a cercaria and send it off to a lab and they'll come back with a diagnosis, a, a, a distinguishing okay. thing. So that's that's what <coughs> the QPCR technique is going to allow you to do much quicker, probably. And you don't need necessarily the 25 years of knowing snails and parasites to do it. You can just send the sample off, and the, the DNA sequence will tell you, not conclusively, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what you have. That's a good reason I ask. I, I live in Elk Lake, and we have a serious problem with this, and, but I don't see a lot of organisms. I mean, there's certain locations that are there. See, and that's, can, yes. But there are other, obviously, tons of other species. Yeah, and that's why you need one of the two of our teams to come in and tell you, diagnose which, which species are present. That's not something you can do overnight, right? right. You need to right. collect the snails, or you need to collect the water samples, and you need to analyze them. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so if, if um, you've got a concentration of swimmer's itch, and there aren't a lot of mallards around, or n not a lot of mergensers around, say if it was mallards, um, are there control techniques for mallards? So there are control techniques for mallards. They're easier to catch. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it, although the DNR doesn't like you messing with mallards because they're hunted, right? Um, but in the past, when we did a study where um, a drug that veterinarians use to kill parasitic worms called prosequantil um, was, and I think Ron actually published that paper, um, was looking, we, we did one on, on commergansers that I did, I think another one was done on mallards, where you give them the drug, and for mallards, you can put it on corn and evaporate it out. And you know, you do this to a mallard and it comes to you, you do this to a commergansers and it flies, yeah. right? So there is, there is, and that, again, what species you have will inform you on what control um, mm -hmm. strategy you should use. Mm -hmm. I think there was, oh, did you have a question earlier? It's been answered. It's been answered, okay. Can you get any information from the skin lesions of the human, of what? Um, that's a good question. I don't think anything's been tried for that. You'd have to get the uh, the sample with the worm, right? Because you're going to need his DNA, and then you're going to have to obviously blank out human DNA from that. I don't know if anybody's ever tried that. That's a great question. If, if you could, let's say, would it give you insight, you know, well, sure. So if you could analyze the DNA of the sacari that penetrated into the papule, you can send it off to the gen bank and it would tell you with high degree of certainty what that species is. That's the huge advancement of mole molecular genetics and, and molecular biology. With Sorry. Oh, so um, when you guys are doing a lake-wide assessment, what are your interactions with riparians like, like if a merganser is running across somebody's lawn, you stop, knock on the door, ask for permission to go? I, sure. What is that Good like? question. Um, if a merganser's running across the lawn, I take a huge picture because I've never seen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Although they will hobble. We've seen them from the, from the island in Higgins Lake after they're in the tree. They, they, yeah. uh, coming from the water, um, yeah. you have right away, you can't put an anchor in anybody's you know um, land. We have, with one exception, where I had the cops call to me at Higgins Lake, and that's partly because it's political. We, we always usually knock on the door and say, can we set up the trap around your dock? And almost everybody's like, yes, please, can I watch? <laughs> and usually we're like, from the window, don't let your dog or cat out because if they come out, the ducks won't come into the trap. So usually people are very receptive when you tell them what you're doing. Um, I did have one person that forbid me to go on the property and yeah, so um, you have to have permission. 
what, what, what is the end game? Get, well, let's take Higgins Lake. So you went from eight to mm -hmm. six to four. If you stop yeah. for a year, does it go back to eight? Or no do you one have knows. to do this well, every year forever? I can tell you that the Glen Lake story got the broods down to zero, and it took four or five years for them to go back up to the numbers, and then they jumped from four to eight in a huge lane. I don't know what their numbers were way before, but um, the end game is we need to find out what causes a certain number of nesting sites on a lake. Is Are the nesting sites limited? Right? If there's only a certain number, then plugging the nest is a strategy. If you plug a nest and they're gonna go to a block over, that's not a good strategy, and we don't know that yet. Right? So part of the reason why we want to mark common regansers is to get information to help us. You know, that's why saying we don't need research isn't really the, the best long-term solution because you're going to find things out in your research to help inform control. But I will tell you that the cost goes way down when the birds aren't there, right? You, you don't have to, you know, Higgins Lake was sick and they needed 24-7 care. And there were five of us that worked for three years on that lake every uh, 15 weeks. Right. Now, they don't need that this year, right? They need uh, a treatment. You go in once a uh, two weeks and trap the birds and you're good to go. So you think you, if you um, swam in an infected area, what is the, uh, what do you do? You just go take a shower really quick or? That's another one of those good, there is a species <laughs> that actually goes through the muskrat that doesn't penetrate your skin until you leave the water. Mm -hmm. But that one's not very common. So if you shower off that mm -hmm. with that species, it'll really help. If you shower off immediately or towel off, you'll get a few of the parasites that just attach to your skin before you left the water. But by then, if you've been in the water for an hour, you know, the first 55 minutes, they're going to have penetrated your skin. So like an alcohol? Lover's well, and that's where we, you know, MISIP is looking at a preventative cream. You know, oh, okay. This is the story I usually tell. Swimmer's itch is the little sister to the big brother of schistosomiasis. And schistosomiasis is a human parasite, it's a human schistosome that kills the second most people parasitic-wise behind malaria in Africa and Asia. Mm -hmm. We have spent, our government has spent lots and lots of money, our military, to try to develop creams to prevent soldiers from, who are in that area from getting infected. To date, none has been, there, there have been some promises, a couple chemicals, um, including DEET <laughs> as one option, um, but more work needs to be done in that. Right, um, and, and maybe Wayne Swallow has got an idea that might work, and so we're curious to see what he's going to have to say. That's a, another attack to control that would be helpful. I know the swimmer's itch guard that you've seen out uh, the, around here. Some people swear by it, and some people swear at it. And, <laughs> and so here's the issue. It's an immune response. Swimmer's itch is an immune response, and about 25 to 30 percent of the people don't ever show symptoms. So I could do a whole bunch of stuff and not get swimmer's itch, and I'm saying, hey, whatever I did worked. Well, the control is, I probably wouldn't have got it anyway, even if I did do that stuff, right? And th my daughter gets it bad, badly, you know? It's just, uh, it's a personal, I do get it badly, though. Yeah? How long can the parasites survive in the water without finding a host? Uh, at maximum, 48 hours. But li the viability probably goes way down, I, I don't, that was a study that I think someone wanted, we wanted to do at one point, but it's a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. You need some volunteers. But for certainly 24 hours, you know, when I counted those in, in a Petri dish, about 24 hours, but I wouldn't go much more than, than that, 48 hours. What impact does temperature have? The, as anything, right, just like enzymes, the cooler the temperature, the slower everything is. So in the spring, oh, that's another good point. Mm -hmm. if, you, if your lakes are interested in doing some assessment. Don't do the work in May and June. The best chance for you to qualify for a permit is to sample in July and August when the warm water's warmer and there's a higher probability of getting, I don't want all, any of your lakes to qualify in some ways, but the fact of the matter is you're probably gonna have some that do. So there is, it's too hot, and by the way, in August, guess what happens? The snails start dying, right? And so you typically see a reduction in summer's itch because the old snails are dying and the new ones are just starting to grow and you don't have the same level as you do in July. So do you have a sweet point of temperatures that these things grow sure. in? Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, I, 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 off the top of my head, um, the water temperature in the middle of July is probably the sweet spot, whatever that is. Um, I don't know, water 70, that's probably pretty warm. But. 
Do you know question. much about the floatable baffle enclosures for swim areas and how effective they are? I don't. I know that work was done on the effectiveness of that, and there's some promising results on that, but I don't. I haven't seen the data to be able to say you know how effective they are. I had that idea a couple of years ago. But I didn't find anything on it, and then I saw it as one of the uh, the options. Sure. Um, I I work at a summer camp that puts roughly a thousand kids into the water every summer. Swimmers' so itches are number one health issue. Yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, I'm thinking that. Uh, you know, from where we are, we have a perfect bay with a lot of minnows, organzas are for the food. I'm glad to know that the re relocation process includes the broods. At first when I heard relocating organzas, well, they're a migratory bird. And right. I'm a waterfowl hunter. I know all of that and how far they travel. So it makes more sense that they are taking the, the young ones before the imprint to an area. And, they can and the young ones are 10 times or more heavily infected than the adults mm -hmm. are. No uh, their immune systems maybe aren't as fully developed or they're getting infected when they don't have full feathers, the down, so they can penetrate easier. We don't really know, but we have sampled enough of young and adults to know that the ducklings are 10 times the, the yeah. level. Yeah. And you can't stop the spring and fall migrants, right? That's, yeah. if you could, to steal a phrase, put a balloon over your lake, you prevent yourself from a but you can't do that. And the baffle, it, it certainly works for the ones on the surface. You probably need something hanging down a little bit because there are gonna be released from snails on the bottom. And then the question is, how much else is that going to pick up, and you know, what's this permeability? Because they are pretty small. Right. Right. Yeah. When I see a picture, I see all the looks like. Yeah. Sugar yeah. Is that a parasite for every one of those? Five? Absolutely right. And every single they live inside the body. They don't live very long at all because they they have a penetration gland, and in the duct, they'll yeah. actually get into the mesentery, the veins, and go to the mesentery around the intestine. But in humans, it can't get through the last layer of our skin, and they die. So then your body, there's an invading something in your body, and it starts swelling, and you get the itchy spot. It's an immune reaction, allergic reaction. How long does that last? Everybody varies. A lot longer than mosquitoes. I've had mine on for seven days. Yeah, it's not pleasant. People go to the hospital because it burns if you get really bad case, like the pictures you had. Ouch. Is there a, natural, a, a barrier you can put on your skin, like, you know, uh, some, somebody once told me, like a sunscreen with an oil base, really lather up your legs good, the little kids? You know. I would like to see a scientific experiment that whatever people use, I'd like to see it tested. It's really hard to test with human subjects. It's really hard mm -hmm. because of requirements. Um, it's, and also, 20, like I said, 20 to 25% of the people don't get it. So I need to see the data. Show me the data and I'll say, okay, I think this works. But I'm not, I, if someone says, yeah, it worked for me, I'm like, great, keep doing it. I don't necessarily believe it's gonna work for everybody. Right? So, and, we're, and again, we're trying to work on that angle. And MSIP is too. What if you put your grandkids in little wetsuits? <laughs> wetsuits will help. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Or long sleeve Sure, shirts. full body, yeah. T-shirt will help probably, you know, again, how tight it is. Um, yeah, swimming out towards the deeper water, you're probably less likely to have the high density of circari, you're still gonna have some. These are all nice, good hints. But, you know, a three-year-old in a wetsuit, that's kind of a little <laughs> bit <laughs> a challenge. I was um, thinking more of a, like, teenager? Bottoms, oh, you sure, know, that, sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, but if they can swim up underneath, mm -hmm. then they Yeah, it's underneath. not gonna be foolproof, yeah. but it's gonna help. But <clears throat> feed Yeah. So, why don't people get swimmers itch on their face, or 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 do they? Because every picture that I I typically see of swimmers itch its legs, body, but not on your face. Um, great question. Probably the exposure amount of time that your face is in the water. You never see it on the hands either. Very right. rarely, right. or on the fingertips. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, your skin, any callus area, I would think would be much harder for the parasite to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, so I. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, dogs will get it? Dogs do get it. <clears throat> Just real quick, like an observation I made over the last 10 years with the incidence of swimmer's itch, I always noticed that lighter complected people seem to be more susceptible to it, where the larger, darker complected campers didn't seem to affect them. And I always wondered what it was, lack of melanism in the Anglo-Saxon people like you and I, or uh, or more of it. But I went to the dermatologist in my <laughs> annual checkup. She's like, well, generally darker complected people have a lower histamine reaction to the, the things in their skin, poison ivy, sun, and, and all the other irritants. So it was very interesting just to, to, to see that. So as a rule, usually it's uh, 
Europeans that are already yep. hailed by it. And I want to remind you again, you know, uh, four years ago, I went to 23 lakes around Douglas Lake with my, to my class. And so we have some preliminary uh, evidence. We were only looking for presence or absence, so we didn't do any quantification. But we know which lakes have stagnicolous snails and which lakes we had evidence of common organzers on. And that's a start. That's where you need to start for the permutate, for the permitting process. <laughs> Gracias.